Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for. Oh, there's. <laughs> Welcome to the to the webinar. We're going to talk about PR today for marketplaces specifically. Um, and I've been. Uh, this is something I've been wanting to do for a while. Uh, and finally, I found someone that I felt was smart and intelligent uh, and had the exact right uh, background as well to to make it poignant towards marketplaces. Um, so now I get to do it. Uh, and Tara is with me. Uh, that's the one I was talking about, in case you were wondering. I will let uh, Tara uh, introduce herself, but uh, first of all, I just want to quickly go over some household uh, rules. Um, please, uh, if you can, uh, participate as much as possible. This is your chance to ask questions from a true PR professional. Um, without having to pay <laughs> so that's great uh, and, uh, <laughs> and and also um you can find the way to uh, post the questions is in the right hand side you'll see like a uh, navigation and there should be a place called questions um feel free to interrupt tara she has said that that's okay uh, so throughout the presentation i'll try and pull in the questions uh, as they come in so don't you don't have to wait to the end um and finally uh, thank you so much for joining us. I will now leave the floor to Tara and she can introduce herself. Hello, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you, Sigrid, for having me. Really excited to be here today. Um, and as Sigrid said, use me, ask me as many questions as you like. We have a, an intimate group, so um, I'm happy to uh, answer questions and help however I can. Um, so my name is Tara O'Donnell. I'm the Managing Director of Hotwire in the UK. We're a global um, integrated communications agency. And um, I, my background is in marketing and communications, and I have uh, worked in a lot of different industries for many different types of companies. So everything from FMCG and travel to a lot of tech. So um, tech and marketplaces um, are a big area for me and I have spent probably the past 15 years focused on, um, on different types of tech companies. So I've seen um, lots in my career and, uh, and today Sigrid asked me to, to come and talk about um, a couple of different things. So um, let me jump into um, let me just see. So um, hopefully everyone can see my slide. Um, so, so I was asked to come today to talk about a few different things. One is around um, generating proactive communications. Uh, this year in particular, I mean, I, I have been around for a long time, over 20 years, but I say 2020 has really been one of the most um, most interesting in different years, and I don't have to explain why, because I know <laughs> everyone probably feels exactly the same way. Um, and, you know, proactive communications in 2020 has been an interesting, uh, interesting to navigate because of everything that's been happening with the pandemic and also the geopolitical um, environment as well. So, um, but you know, I know in particular for, for marketplaces as well, it's really critical to ensure that, um, you know, that you're developing proactive communications and, and really trying to get your, your brand out there to build trust with your audiences. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that, even if you don't have news, um, which, uh, you know, is often the case. And then also, um, we're going to touch on how communications can help build brand advocacy because um, marketplaces in particular don't just need users, they need fans, they need advocates, they, they need people who are going to recommend and share. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then also um, around preparing for negative sentiment. So how do you build brand trust so that when something does go wrong, that you're prepared to, uh, to to deal with that, and your brand has that strength to be resilient, and those advocates will will be on your side. So um, I will just uh, jump in because I believe I'm going to be speaking 
for about half of the webinar, and then um, we're going to do a Q and A. So uh, I don't want to take up too much time just talking. Uh, so I'm going to move on just to a couple of, of stats. Um, again, I mentioned 2020, interesting year. Interesting, probably maybe not the best term, but um, and and what's happened and what's really been impacting the comms landscape. So. Um, you know, so first of all, consumer trust is at an all-time low um, for lots of different reasons. But there's, um, you know, 55%, as you can see here, of consumers that they would be less likely to buy or they would never buy a product that's advertised alongside fake or inflammatory news. Um, I think that this is, uh, this goes probably beyond just fake and inflammatory news. There's, you know, there's, um, also advertisements and other things that are, you know, concerning on the internet. And that kind of plays to some of these other points here that people are using the internet more than ever, obviously webinars and um, Zoom calls and everyone is constantly either on their phone or on their computer. There's been a huge increase in the amount of people who have been using particularly social media sites um, so 41% of, um, of consumers have visited all three Facebook services, meaning Facebook, Instagram, and what's up, what's up, what's that, sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's up a lot this year, and we know why. Um, you know, in addition, there's been lots of different um, features added to, to those, uh, those different channels, like, you know, Instagram added their um, their shop pages, and 60% of Instagram users say that now they're they're shopping through there. That's how they're discovering uh, new products. And um, Twitter is also up. So news people are sharing their news across social more than ever before, and I'm sure you can relate to that. And that's where you're seeing a lot of your updates. So it does have an impact on you know on us as comms professionals and making sure that we're, uh, we're sharing there and we're creating news that is shareable. Um, security is a top priority. Um, again, even more so now because of everything that's all, you know, all of the online usage, all the online shopping that's happening. Um, security is particularly top of mind to, um, to buyers. And, um, i would say a couple of other things here. 32% reading more people reading newspapers. That's up because newspapers were not necessarily considered, you know, the, um, the, the de facto in recent years, but it has increased in 2020. Um, and people are reading more just, you know, there's a lot more going on, I suppose, and people are turning to, to newspapers. So it's important to make sure that you're appearing there. Um, and the other piece here is, you know, consumer trust, this kind of goes back to um, that first point that I made. Consumer trust is down. So they're, re you know, they're really looking at brands that show some type of um, purpose and brand value. And it's a way of differentiating from others, other, um, other marketplaces. If you're showing that you have a brand purpose and that you're, um, in uh, many cases, supporting, you know, local causes or some type of a cause. So um, with all that in mind, what does that mean? So <clears throat> with all of that clutter happening online and everyone um, sharing everything, um, we need to make sure that we're cutting through all of that. And to do that, it's by taking an integrated approach. So ensuring that all of your comms are touching your, your customers um, along their um, journey. So from broader awareness um, in media down to social media and ensuring that there's volume and velocity, making sure your message is getting out on a regular basis. Um, being relevant, that's critical. You wanna make sure that whatever you're putting out there, it matters to people and they're going to share it. They want to share it. Um, that is going to be important. That's always been important, but it will continue to be very important during this um, very busy time from a communication standpoint. And, um, and trust, you know, we've seen a lot happen in the last year that has eroded trust. So being sure you're proactive about building that trust 
especially um, in preparation for anything that, that could happen um, that might go wrong. Can so, I just jump um, in with a question with, here, just for a second? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I really like these stay on top of mind, be relevant, build branch trust. But I'm also thinking when you're saying stay up on top of mind, you're saying uh, that's a lot that has been going on this year. Uh, it's has it been harder to cut through the noise and and in that case do you need to be more creative because i know that i, I work with marketing right so i've been like okay let's see can we do something that add values to the whole discussion around the the pandemic uh, but everyone else has the same idea right so cutting through the the noise and being relevant but also i guess creativity thinking outside of the box what do you think that yeah, absolutely. Actually, creativity is more important than ever. So it's been important, but creativity is what is helping brands cut through right now. I would also say, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, there's two other there's two other pieces to that. Um, I would say one is ensuring that you're focusing on your audience and what your audience cares about. So yes, your audience cares about obviously, you know. COVID-19 and what's happening, but they care about other things too. So um, what is that key insight that you have about your audience that you can focus on, particularly one that you can solve a pain for? So, um, you know, if your audience is, let's say, talking about COVID-19 in particular, um, if your audience cares about um, health, for example, are there things that you can do, messages that you can put out there that relate to health products? Um, you know, like just looking at very specific niche type messages that are going to resonate with your audience. So I think that's key. And then also the second piece is that it maps to your, your brand values. So it, I think 2020 has given a lot of companies the opportunity to reevaluate their, their brand and the values that they hold um, and and then tie it to external comms. Um, what is it, you know, why do they get up in the morning? Um, what is it that, that that brand means to their employees as well as to their customers? And then how do you, how do you use that as your anchor for all of your communications? Um, I think that gets, lost when companies are really busy and but a lot of brands this year we've seen taking a step back going back to basics and thinking okay what do we stand for what is the purpose what are our brand values um, and then how do you translate that into in relevant messages in the wider context of your audience and um, I think those things you know just jumping on the bandwagon of different topics that are out there at the moment can be difficult because it's so crowded so it's really looking for something specific that you can address yeah i think that's a good point and just if I, if i refer back to the previous slide where you mentioned a lot of things that we've seen increase or decrease this year and um, i know that dating sites also saw an enormous boost because of the pandemic and people like initially were worried about meeting but then they had time sitting at home <laughs> finding a date right but then what you said right now is if we can help if a brand can help um, media uh, explain to people how they can solve the problem of how do you meet in a pandemic uh, without it being dangerous, maybe that's a good kind of news story. So I would assume that stories like that would be something that media would pick up on. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, um, one of our clients um, is, a, is a dating app, OkCupid. And um, what we've focused on this year has been exactly that. It's been sharing you know, a lot of information, educational tips, um, and also fun stories about how people are dating during the pandemic, um, and looking for trends and things that matter to them. So we've been able to use their data, which is really um, a, a great um, tool if you, you know, in a marketplace, you always have a lot of data and you can look and see what trends are, are um, appearing and impacting people. So um, we used a lot of their data this year to see what are people thinking about during the pandemic? What are they worried about? Um, what are they going to, 
do? How are they going to do it? And we built stories around that. Um, and we're able to get a lot of, of cut through. Um, actually, the, currently we're working on a story for them right now. It's slowed out in the media, but um, it's called uh, <clears throat> Lock Blocking, <laughs> which is all about um, the, uh, the, the current lockdown in the UK and how do you deal with that again? Yeah. You know, this next wave of um, dating. So, uh, yeah, you can find really creative ways to um to create to build stories i would say another example of that which um i was uh i was going to talk about i was going to try and weave in here so it's a good example but was um you know just before the pandemic hit um you know the environment was very top of mind and um we noticed that again, data from OKCupid was showing that, that that is what people cared about. So they weren't worried about necessarily just going on dates, but they were, they did want to date people who cared about the environment. So we built a whole story around, um, it, it, well, we labeled it Thurnberging. So it was like a new trend in dating. People who cared, of, you know, got together because they both cared about the environment. So that that's a great, like you were talking about creativity. That's how you can take something, um, take a trend that you find from your data, package it, and then turn it into an interesting story by just putting an interesting label on it. So and and the, actually, the with, nice with Biden coming back uh, now, he is, the environment is going to be focus again, I guess. And uh, that's something that marketplaces can definitely jump on as well with the, you know, reusable, uh, yeah, um, so reusing other people's items and selling that, that there's a whole story there as well, I guess. <clears throat> absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's going to continue to be a big story, I would say, um, you know, well, forever. But yes, definitely. Um, Wait, I hope you'll get so, back to the deck. And if anyone else has questions, feel free to shoot them in here. Yeah. Yeah, please do. Um, so. I was just going to touch on this for a second. This is um, an advocacy loop. And, and when we're talking to our clients about how do we build, um, I've said in the beginning, you know, you don't just need users, you need fans. You need people who are going to talk about your brand, share your brand, um, you know, live and breathe your brand and stand up for you if something goes wrong. So um, we, we look at this as a constant cycle, right? So you're you're building awareness with people to start with, but then you're bringing them along this journey and you want to see them, you know, you want to see them become fans, advocates, ambassadors at some point. Um, so there's, there's lots of different ways that you can, that comms can play a role in this journey and help bring your, your users into fandom. Um, and I'm just going to talk about that for a second. So where can, where can you play a role? Um, so at the top of that funnel, you know, so awareness, it's like getting to know your brand. Um, you know, media relations comes in here, uh, influencer relations, which is um, very popular and continues to, to work well, especially if you're finding influencers that, uh, map to your brand values, as I was saying earlier, that is a, a really good way of, of building awareness for for your marketplace um, and brand and advertising campaigns. But as you move through that funnel, you need to, you know, get closer and closer to that customer. So um, so then looking for ways to engage them. So social media owned content that is going to drive them um, to your to your site. Um, and then, you know, getting to building trust, that consideration evaluation where they're actually purchasing from your, from your site. And, um, that comes through things like awards, uh, reviews, peer recommendations. And ultimately, everything that we're doing is for them to act. We want them to become fans. We want them to bond with our brand. Um, we want them to share on social media. Uh, we want them to leave reviews. Um, you know, and, and add to our trust scores. So comms plays a really important role in that advocacy loop. 
And um, it's important that, you know, you're thinking about that when you're building your stories and where they fit. And then also what, um, what different touch points you want those stories to, to, you know, to be shared and served to your, your customers. So if we think about the story itself, um, how do we cut through? And, what, and you know, we already kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, how, do you, how do you tell a story that's going to be relevant in the middle of the pandemic, um, but also just in, in general, that is, is going to, when you don't have news, but you need to be able to capture people's attention. As I've already said, start with your audience. Um, so we always, we, you know, we never recommend to our clients to take a one size fits all approach. Um, you really need to have an insight about your audience, even if you're choosing a particular um, segment of your audience for a campaign or a story. Um, what's, what's the insight? What is the pain? Is there a pain that you can help to solve for those people? Um, or is there some other motivation? Um, for them that, that you can address. So by starting there, um, you can ensure that it's going to be relevant, whatever you're talking about. And then making it, um, you know, whatever that story is that you're building, making it authentic and memorable and shareable, as we just talked about. So um, everything that we do, we need to ensure that it's shareable, that there's going to be uh, something topical about it that's going to grab attention. Um, and then to the end goal, which is influencing behavior, which is you want them to act, you want them then to go to your marketplace, you want them to share it, you want them to do something at the end of it. So a, an example of this is um, one of our clients, uh, Verbo, which was formerly HomeAway, um, that is a, um, you, you may be familiar with it, but it, it's a marketplace for holiday homes. And um, we did some consumer research last year uh, about, like, you know, what's the most important thing to families when they're on holiday. And one of the key insights that came out of it was, like, a pain point for them was things left behind when on holiday. And, um, and one of those things, the number one thing was a child's teddy bear or some type of a toy. We used a teddy bear as the example. Um, so children often leave things behind and then it causes lots of pain to the parents once they leave there. So um, once we understood that that was a pain point for the audience, we built a whole campaign around it and we made it authentic by creating what was called the Teddy Express. So if your teddy bear or other child's toy was found left in your holiday home, that um, home away would home away was branded home away at the time would pay for that toy teddy bear to be sent back to you. Um, so it was very authentic. But then we created a whole video series around it, you know, showing what that child goes through, what the parents go through, to make it really memorable and shareable, um, and ultimately driving people back to home away to um, to look at homes to rent for their holidays. And it increased um, website visits by like 50% in the two months that the, that video, um, the, that whole video series ran and got loads of media and it won lots of awards too, which is always good. But, um, you know, so it, but again, it started out with, and, you know, that, that was happening because there's lots happening in the world at that time too. But it, because we were focusing on an audience insight, um, we were able to make it relevant and make it cut through. So just an example of, of how you might be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, as the parent myself, that definitely resonates with me. So <laughs> good job on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so this, this is kind of a, um, a broad view of um, how do we, how do we create a story? Um, so Communications actually for all time has actually been applied through the lens of these different pillars. So, um, you know, fame and celebrity, controversy, topicality, I won't go through all of them, um, but these are all important components to telling a story that's going to get cut through. 
Um, because when we tell a story, um, oftentimes, you know, when we're developing it, we should always be thinking to ourselves, so what? Why would anyone care? Um, and in order to, you know, to make sure that someone does care, once you have that insight, you can layer on these different characteristics to then grab more attention. Um, so, you know, I think the, the number one thing here, I won't go through all of these because we would be here for a long time, but uh, the number one thing here really, I think for us is topicality. It's not necessarily having news, but it's ensuring you understand what's happening in the news agenda and being aware of the context in which you are putting out a story. Um, so, you know, there's examples of when this has gone wrong for brands, um, you know, when they're not thinking about the context in which they are putting something out. You know, there's an example of, of I think it was last year when H&M did an ad campaign and it was like a, a adorable young um, black boy, but his shirt said coolest monkey in the jungle, which caused a lot of controversy and issues. And, you know, they didn't even think about what that could mean to people. There's lots of like context is so critical. So you need to make sure one, that you're finding topical things to tie to, but two, that you're understanding the wider context of that at all times. Um, but it's always fun, like if you think about even the um, the Teddy Express example that I just gave, or the Thurnberging example with OK Cupid, we were tying into um, in Thurnberging topical news um, in you know the home away example, uh, more humor and um, and something that means you know was really emotional for people. So. Um, Layer these, layer these different pillars on top of um, on top of all of your stories, and you can ensure success. Yeah, I actually have a good example from one of our clients, uh, EBK, who uh, at the, when at the beginning of the pandemic realized that uh, the best thing they could do was to support um, the community. So they created a free um, a free category called neighborhood help. Uh, where people could free of charge upload offers of help with shopping or whatever people needed um, and they got a ton of good press from that and a ton of also a ton of loyal loyalty from uh, from the users and actually managed to during the the kind of height of the pandemic increase their i think it was i think they reached 40 million live ads a month uh, when everyone else was struggling and but mainly because they were focusing on something that you say topical uh, but keeping in mind the kind of human interest and the uh, and and the users basically catering to them yeah 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 i mean that's a really good example and you know we've seen examples like similar type examples where um, businesses have been supporting each other during this time, which has also gotten a lot of um, press because it has that feel good factor that it's not just about them. It's about their, you know, they're looking at what's happening externally. So, you know, um, I know Etsy did something around small businesses um, and supporting each other. And then also, uh, I think it was Burger King had uh, recently put out um, an ad which was about supporting, you know, saying to their customers, go visit McDonald's, go visit <laughs> KFC, go visit, you know, at, like listing literally all of the fast food restaurants that are franchises. Those are all small businesses owned by franchisees. And um, so, you know, they were essentially saying, you know, not that we, you know, we still think ours is the best, but support your local businesses. And if you're not going to come here, at least go to one of our, you know, competitors. And it got tons of press because, again, they were tying into, you know, small businesses are struggling. And, um, you know, doing something like that is the way to, you know, catch the attention. So, it's look, again, it goes back to your point about being creative. Be creative and but tie into something that means, you know, that has that human interest story to it or um, topicality. 
I think I should hurry up. I'm time wise. I'm not doing very well. Um, should I? How? What should I do from a time perspective? Just keep going. I think. Uh, I think it's uh, it's interesting as long as it's interesting and people are not forced to stay. So uh, yeah, keep going. But we can try and talk less. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. So we've kind of touched on this already, but there's a there's the importance of brand trust now is probably oh, feels anyway more, it's always been important but it feels extra important these days um and crisis often comes out of the blue um it's it's when you're least expecting it and um you know so having that brand trust in place already can help support you when something bad happens um i have a good example of this, but I'll come to it in a minute. Um, you know, I won't spend a lot of time on these stats. This is research that Hotwire did. Actually, it was done in 2019, but it's still really relevant now. Um, and interestingly, like, uh, you know, I, I think trust is, is always going to have a similar type, re, you know, reaction to people that people, um, as I was mentioning in the beginning, they care about values and they make decisions based on a company's values. So whether it's partnering, um, whether it's, you know, buying from a company that um, has, you know, ethical suppliers um, or, or not, you know, or it is around, you know, just feeling that they're, that a brand or a service has um, violated their own personal values, it's so important. It's so important that brands have their values at the forefront all the time and that they are thinking about what others value as well um, because a, um, a crisis, you know, a well-handled crisis can really help your, your brand. One that is, is not helped, you know, not handled well can really hurt your brand. So, um, you know, for example, I guess this is now probably a couple of years ago, but when um, Oxfam, when it was uncovered that um, that they their employees in Haiti um, after a, a disaster, after the Haiti earthquake, they were um, they were you know their employees were paying for sex of survivors, and um, they tried to cover it up. And then when it was you know when it did come out. They, they really did not handle it well. It took them a long time to deal with it. They didn't deal with it um, in the right way. And what did that mean? It meant that, you know, people stopped donating. People pulled their donations. There's, you know, it was not handled well. Um, there's the, you know, almost, I feel like I'm talking about fast food a lot, but there's the, the great example from, I guess it was two years ago with um, KFC when they ran out of chicken which was a crisis that was handled very well. Um, and, you know, they came out and said, you know, what kind of, you know, we're a chicken restaurant and we ran out of chicken. All we can say is we're sorry. Um, and people really value that. And you know what KFC is, is doing very well and continues to as, as a, you know, global business. So um, it's really important that, um, that you're thinking about the values that people have and your own values and, and how you address those. Um, so what do all those stats mean and what can you do to, um, to prepare uh, and make sure that your, your brand has trust and that you're, um, and that you're, you know, you're able to handle crisis. The, the example I was going to give before we run, really run out of time because I'm sure we are, um, is, uh, is Zoom. And so Zoom is one of our clients and we've been working with them for about a year. And, you know, we did a lot with them. They, they had an interesting challenge because they became a consumer brand overnight. They weren't, they never intended to be a consumer brand. They were a business to business brand. And now, you know, all of a sudden with like, you know, no notice, they had millions of consumers using their platform and um, and that created some interesting challenges for them. And a lot of the work that our team did was 
constantly, you know, um, going out and talking about their security updates, about um, about how great the platform is, the the technology, how advanced it is, the the team behind it as well, you know, what the company stands for, and um, and really built trust. You know, they went through some difficult times and um, and and had to navigate through those times, but because they had built a good relationship with their users, they were able to um, to keep it together and they were able to, you know, they are still like doing very, very well. And, um, and they were able to have, you know, when things did happen, when crises did happen, they held it, you know, they apologized, they fixed things and they moved on. So I just think it's really important that, um, that, you know, companies are are being proactive when it comes to building trust and um and handling any crisis situations but the um, reason zoom got so, out of this uh, positively isn't that also like yeah, you did a good job for them obviously but they also took action right so they it wasn't just that you were painting a pretty picture of them they actually followed up and fixed the issues as fast as they could uh, so it goes Maybe. back to what you were saying before as well with uh, with being authentic. You can't just stand yeah. and paint, paint a pretty picture. You also have to back it up with actions. Then otherwise people will lose trust really fast. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yes. So um, and that, you know, I think that that is um, that's critical in any business. You know, I, I think about um, Pret a Manger a couple of years ago when they had that issue um, when a girl died from eating, um, you know, peanut based food, nut based food in their restaurant. They were really slow to um, to fix, you know, to, to change their menu. They were really slow to apologize as well. Um, and, you know, it hurt their business for a long time because People didn't trust them. You need to make, yeah, it has to be a business shift. It can't just be communications. Absolutely. It has to be authentic, everything that you're doing. So, um, so yes, a hundred percent. So, so I just wanted to really touch quickly on future proofing, making sure that your company is protected for when, um, for when a crisis arises, arises. So uh, there's, Four points that I'm just going to touch on, which is the, quickly, is just checking your goals, pressure testing your values, value-based communications, and preparing your C-suite. Um, so, on checking your goals, this is just um, always checking your mission um, against your um, consumer-centric view. Like it, we mentioned this earlier, you need to think about um your purpose uh and and those ne those need to come out but you need to be thinking about it more broadly than just internally it can't just you can't just think about your own company your own product your own service you have to pressure test that against what's happening in the world what consumers care about what your audience cares about um so ensuring that you do that will make sure that you are um have a good foundation in place um also, your values. So, um, you know, I think again, as I mentioned earlier, this this year was a, an opportunity for companies to step back, think about their values. Are they clear? Are they actionable? Um, you really need to take stock of your values. You need to benchmark the understanding of your values by your employees. That's really critical um, because you know, a bunch of words, fluffy words, don't mean anything if you're not able to action them, live by them, work by them. So making sure that, that you have those in place. Um, and then those values have to be lived, breathed, and communicated by everyone within an organization. Um, a lot of times you might see a company's values just being talked about maybe by people in culture, or HR, but people have to feel that they are ingrained within the business and they need, you know, from a receptionist to the CEO, they all need to feel that they're living by them. 
um, and that they're, they're mandatory and that it's not, again, just words, but when decisions are being made in an organization, they are thinking about those values as part of that decision-making process. Um, and then lastly, um, on the C-suite. So again, it's, um, you know, values need to be within the boardroom as well. So, um, you know, it, it's important that, you know, you're using those as a, a people and culture tool, um, that your, your C-suite really knows how to, to talk about them, that you're able to, as I just mentioned, that when decisions are being made, that they're standing by them. They can't just be words on a piece of paper. So, um, so just uh, in summary, you know, ensuring that your values are forefront will really help you from a brand perspective. Um, and when then a crisis hits, you'll you'll have those foundational brand values that you can rely on when you're communicating externally. Um, so that I think is it. I know I went way over time, so I apologize for that. That's okay. Um, I think uh, I have a couple of questions for you um, after this, uh, and if anyone else has, please put them in the uh, in the question box to your right, I guess. Uh, on the screen, there should be a place called questions, and you can just throw them in now for Terry. This is your chance to get a real PR person to talk to you and help solve all of your problems and challenges straight away. <laughs> Uh, but but um, something that really resonated with me, Tara, was um, like throughout this discussion, I, I just remembered back in when I was a student back in the early 2000s, uh, I was studying a topic that wasn't very common in Denmark, where I'm originally from. Uh, so I was on the lookout for books on the topics um, and I found Amazon. And uh, I still remember kind of like with shaking hands, putting in my credit card, card details and actually considering uh, whether or not I should create like a whole account just for internet purchases. Um, and uh, like, I was worried about what I would get. I was worried about them stealing my credit card details. I was worried about, yeah, I don't know what I was, like everything just went through my mind. It was, it was a very kind of like scary thing to put that in. And since I was a student, it was not like I was a rich person <laughs> either. Yeah. Um, but but I'm just thinking, um, I guess for all of us gathered in kind of this call, it's kind of second nature now to like, I don't even think about it anymore when I put in my credit card details, right? And that's probably also that has to do with a lot of security payment uh, uh, networks, but also because I have more faith in in uh, in platforms taking care of their content. Uh, although in the line of work I have, I maybe I shouldn't because we see scams every day. Uh, but I'm just thinking about. I think a lot of people feel like me, but now with uh, with Corona, we have had a lot of less tech savvy people uh, entering the internet and starting to buy through platforms and some of them I would say are even close to digi digitally dyslexic. Uh, I was having a call with uh, my, my partner's mom the other day trying to walk her through uh, what links she shouldn't click on. So with, with kind of that in mind, how important is trust building then in 2020? Um, is something we can forget about? Are everyone okay with transacting? And you know, I'm kind of putting the answers in your mouth here because it's obvious, right? But I would like you to to talk a little bit around that. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's probably more important than ever because you made the point that um, a lot of new audiences have switched to online buying, who typically, you know, um, you mentioned your mom. They're, you know, my dad's the same. It, he never, ever, ever would have put his credit card, even like, you know, last year onto a computer. And now he's being forced to, and he's really intimidating for a lot of people. So, um, so I think absolutely more than ever, uh, brand trust and, um, you know, is, is critical because you're going to think twice about, you know, and I, and I also think the way a brand looks as well. So, like when you go to their site, um, there's uh, you get a feeling of trust when you go to an online marketplace, depending on how it looks, 
the yeah. words that are being used. It's really important because um, when you have new users, if it's not inviting, it's, it's not easy to use. Plus, if the brand is not well known for some reason, um, you know, you're going to lose customers. So, so I think there's an awareness piece because people, once they're aware of a, a brand, um, will feel more familiar. So there's the awareness piece and then there is the trust piece as well. So it's really having to drill down and, and kind of try to do both of those. But I think it's critical these days because, um, yeah, there's, it's good for marketplaces that there's all these new audiences online, but now you just need to educate them, move them over, build their trust. For sure. We got a question here um, from Yelena. We are often asked as specialists for questions related to fraud, and we have a good coverage of our answers. We tried this year twice to publish PR actively instead of proactively answering to requests. This topic was good and interesting, honestly, but no newspaper were interested in it. It's a little bit difficult to communicate on something else than on a fraud topic in that case. Yeah, so I think okay. what you're saying, saying is that she, uh, like normally when, when there's a topic uh, on fraud, newspapers will come to them and ask for their in, uh, expert opinion. But now they were trying to be proactive and send out a story they had built themselves and no newspaper picked that up. Mm. Um, I think, well, it, de it depends, I think, going back to the components that we talked about earlier that stories should have. One, one thing that I, I know for sure from this year in particular is data-driven stories are working um, a lot more than non-data-driven stories. So. In, if you're using your your uh, marketplace data or your company's data to build that story around, that usually will help to to drive coverage. Um, so that's important. And then also, you know, there's the topicality. But I've I have seen, you know, we've had clients who have done some interesting things and created some interesting stories. Let's say around what they've done with the NHS and security, but so have probably 50 other companies. So there is, depending on the story and what you're trying to break into, there is um, more competition. So I would say data, and I would say those pillars that I talked about earlier, um, layering those on top, and then also thinking about who, the media that you're trying to get that into, that readership, what do, they, what do they care about most? So going back to that idea of the audience insight, were you addressing an audience, a particular audience insight. And if you put that lens on everything, um, are we addressing a pain point? Or do we have data to back it up? And have we added some kind of a layer, whether it's, um, you know, from the, from the pillars, then, uh, you know, hopefully that will increase your chances of success. Is it just from uh, the, the interaction I have had with journalists, and this might be unfair, and I'm sorry to any journalists <laughs> watching this, but in general, it also seems to be easier to sell bad and negative stories uh, than positive stories. So, for instance, uh, we often get asked for, oh, how bad is it in, on the internet? And but then when we go back and, back and say, well, I mean, if for our clients who are, who are actually doing something about it, it's actually not that bad. Or they want us to talk about censorship and we're saying, well, our clients in general don't want to censor, they just want to keep their clients safe. Um, and then they, they don't want to talk to us anymore. Uh, so is that, right. is that just something I am uh, I'm, uh, feeling or is it true that you have to have kind of like a, a little bit of a negative spin on it or sensational at least? Um, you know, uh, controversy sells, there's no doubt about it. So, um, if you can, um, you know, I think that a way to deal with that <clears throat> is to highlight something controversial that's happening and then, you know, follow it up with then what's a solution to that and how are you helping that solution? But, you know, there's no doubt that um, having some type of controversy is not necessarily the right word, but, you know, some type of um, 
angle, uh, you know, and yeah, unfortunately bad stories sell more than, uh, you know, more than the positive ones, but you can, you can look at, okay, what, what is it that's happening? Um, find some data points on that, that will bring that story to life. So you're creating that tension, you know, so always try to create a tension in any story. So it's like, what is the problem? And what are we trying to solve? What's the pain? You know, what's the solution? And, um, and that should help. So rather than just going out with a positive story, frame it, frame it first. Yeah. I, I was just thinking that in kind of the 10 years I've been in the, in the online marketplace uh, industry, I've seen a lot of like bad PR. So there was, you know, and a lot of it is caused by constant not properly managed, which I may have some sort of, <laughs> that that's the kind of stories I see as well, obviously. Um, but uh, like there was the back page, um, whole back page spectacle in 2018 that ended up as more as a PR headache actually, because the owner ended up being arrested for human trafficking. So that, that's like on the totally other end. But if he had just started managing his content at some point, uh, it could have been avoided. Um, and, and then um, there's a lot of back press around uh, counterfeits as well, um, which unfortunately is still hard to manage. Um, so would you kind of agree that when we talk about bad press at least, um, to avoid that, the key component is to just make sure that your brand is presented properly, that you manage the content users are putting up. And then, as you said, with the story with um, uh, Pedro Mancier, uh, that you go out and actually apologize and, and deal with the things fast enough afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you, you need to you need to have that layer of brand trust built already. But then when, um, when something happens, the more authentic a company is in dealing with it, the better. Um, so there are, there are good examples out. I mean, well, we talked about KFC is a good example. There's another good example, an American airline um, called Southwest had oh, yeah. a couple of years ago. He, yeah. The huge technical, Glitch, <laughs> glitch. I don't know if that's the right. That's like an understatement, but um, but they actually went out. Um, they apologized. They allowed their customer service people to apologize, which a lot of companies do not do. Um, they took you know full responsibility for it. They put out a video which was really you know authentic and transparent, and they handled it in the right way. And that can you know when a company does go through a crisis like that. Um, the way they deal with it really forms their brand value for years to come and it, it sticks with them for a long time. So there's a million and one bad examples, but, you know, there's the handful of good examples that we, you know, should point to that are, um, that we can learn from as well. So you learn from the, the bad, but you need to learn from the good. So Definitely. Like the Teddy Express, I love that. We have another question here. Um, uh, we're, we're running out, out of time, uh, but let's just cover this and see if you have any other questions for Tara, put them in now because now we're about to wrap up. So question here, if there is a very negative post on Facebook from a user, should we contact them to solve it or which way should we contact them via Facebook? So I assume here as well, like in relation to PR, that could easily become a PR issue uh, if someone has a lot of followers or blow it up on social media. Yeah. Um, so typically we would always, when somebody has a negative comment on social media, we look at their influence first before we determine whether or not to respond to them because you can make an issue worse by responding to somebody who has thousands and thousands of, of followers and it's better to just then contact them you know, offline. Um, so sending them a, a, a message or, you know, and just asking them to get in touch. Um, so it, it really depends on, on the scenario. I think you have to look at um, the severity of what they're, they're saying. Is it something that other people are also um, dealing with? Like that they might be talking about something that you've had 10 other people also say that you really need to address um if rather than it being like a one-off 
Um, but I would say that you need to look at the influence of those people before you decide how to address it um, and whether you do it publicly or whether you do it privately. But I would say always make sure that you're addressing it, right? So um, because it could quickly uh, escalate. So. Yeah, I've worked in the customer customer support for many years actually, and what I would just add to that, uh, from that perspective, is if you're gonna address it publicly, uh, well, I mean, if you're gonna address it at all, but if you're gonna address it publicly specifically, make sure that you can solve the issue in a way that will make them happy, because if you're gonna publicly tell them, oh, I'm sorry, uh, tough luck that's not going to end well for anyone. Uh, so don't do that. And if you cannot solve it in the way that they want you to solve it, make sure that you have some sort of follow-up plan on how to at least make them content with the solution and feel like they have one in quotation mark or they actually have gotten your um, your full attention and feedback. And, and like it, it, it's just so important. You cannot tell someone no in public and expect them to react positively uh, to that. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep, I agree. And I think uh, just to uh, to kind of wrap this up, uh, since there's no more questions at the moment, um, first of all, uh, thank you so much for attending, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tara, for joining. Uh, of course, if you need help with managing kind of the, the, the content moderation on your side, uh, you can uh, reach out to me or you can um, go to our website and uh, fill out the form, but uh, feel free to reach out directly to me and I'll put you in contact with someone who can discuss that uh, just to have your house in order before you go out and uh, get media attention. <laughs> you don't want it to look bad when you actually get that attention. Um, and Tara, I'll leave the floor uh, for you to wrap up with a question uh, that you may or may not be able to answer. But what is the worst backlash you've ever seen in your career PR-wise and what caused it? Um, hmm. Let's see. Well, I would say, I don't know if, um, I don't know if this is the worst, but this is like top of mind for me at the moment, just because of everything that's happened um, in, I would say, this past year, that um, when I think about everything that the government has been doing around COVID, and when they, do you remember back, I guess it was in the summer, and they switched the campaign from stay home to stay alert. Do you remember that? Or oh, in the UK, sorry, this is very UK specific. I don't know where our attendees are far from. but. Um, and moving that to stay alert was just really confusing and people didn't understand it. And it created, not only did it create lots of, um, you know, backlash on social media. I mean, thousands, hundreds, thousands of people were like took to social media to talk about it. Um, but it also like really created, I, I think it was quite dangerous because nobody understood what the message meant. And all of a sudden, People are like, does this mean I don't have to stay at home anymore? What am I supposed to do? Should I be going to work? Should I, what should I be doing? Um, and so I think, you know, I think sometimes messages when they're not the right message, when it's not the right message, it's not communicated in the right way, can actually be dangerous outside of just from a brand or communications perspective. It can actually have, you know, it has impact on people's lives. So. Um, for me, that's just top of mind this year. I mean, I'm, there's been so many, you know, PR backlashes uh, in my 25 years, um, but <laughs> that sort of stands out as one of the things that could have been done so much better. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, so if you have any more questions that you didn't put in to Tara or to me, uh, feel free to reach out and I'm sure Tara will be happy to, to answer. Um, we're also going to send out a, an ebook in a couple of days, possibly early next week that Tara has been helping us create uh, on trust. So there's gonna be a lot of extra great advice in there. Um, so that will land in your inbox uh, soon. Uh, and then the recording of this webinar is also going to uh, be sent to you once it's edited and, and, um, and uploaded. So you can share it with your colleagues if anyone are interested in also listening to, to Tara. So uh, thank you, Tara. Thank you, attendees. Thank you. It was really fun. Thanks so much.